When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting. The A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello and welcome to Rewind a Raw. John Pollock and Waiting back in Toronto. Hello, Way. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing great. Happy Family Day. Happy Family Day. Yeah. A, sh- a shout out on Raw, no less. I did not expect that. No. Our local holiday getting recognized on a internationally broadcasted show. It's yeah. not the whole country that acknowledges Family Day. It is select provinces if i if i have it correct i believe it is bc alberta saskatchewan ontario and new brunswick i think i think i I think you're pretty close i think it's yeah did you even say alberta as well yes okay i I, I think you got it yeah in manitoba it's louis real day in pei it's islander day and in nova scotia it's nova scotia heritage day so no matter what you're celebrating in our great country um (laughs) I hope you had a good one. Would have been a mouthful for Bailey to include all of those distinctions. So she got the yeah. pass on that. But yes, this is a, um, a relatively newer holiday. I guess it's, what, like 15 years or so ago. They said, hey, you've, you've got a holiday now. I want to say it was like 2008, I think, that they introduced this. Well, I'm not going to start debating you about dates. So Well, you, get, you can fact it. check by all means. I mean, we're, we're having conversations here. And sometimes, you know what, folks, we're, we're trying to recollect as best we can. Uh, but, but it's a holiday they essentially created because uh, people need a day off and, uh, in February and there's a gap there. So let's just come up with some bullshit name for it. Uh, what is something people won't object to? Family. <laughs> so. Oh, come on. We're tired of families. Yeah. <laughs> hard yeah. to, uh, hard to argue with that one. Did you do anything, um, notable on family day? Yeah. My parents came over and like, you know, they, they got to play with Oscar and you know, every time I get to see them interact, it's always just amazing. So, um, yeah, so I got to enjoy that. That's How fun. about you? I went to the art gallery. I actually saw some photos from your wife's Instagram. What, which art, like, what art gallery? Or, I mean, um, what was the exhibit that you guys were at? Um, I don't know if it was, like, a specific theme. It was just, uh, we went to, like, the kids' area, and then we looked at, there was this one room that you go in, and you get 60 seconds to go in there, and it's just all these different mirrors, and there's these balls hanging that are mirrors as well. So it's it's kind of trippy for 60 seconds. That I went to something little... like that from uh, this artist named Yoyoi Kusama. So I don't know if it was that same thing or just probably something like it. Okay. Well, they're that great was, uh... Uh, photo opportunities. Yes. You, you're allowed to take photos, just not with a flash. They had some very specific rules for this room. I guess, I guess flash could do some damage with all those mirrors. Yeah. The, wouldn't that suck? How many bad years of luck would you have if the whole room just shattered? Um, it's a lot. Hundred, I guess. Yeah, do you believe in that superstition? Like you break a mirror, or you walk under no. a ladder. Do you? I don't subscribe. I don't to believe in many either. many superstitions. No, no, neither do I. I kind of see them as a little silly. Okay, just curious. I would always be the guy that would walk under a ladder just to get the reaction out of my friends in elementary school. They'd be like, "Ooh, I'm like yeah, <laughs> terrible. What 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 could go wrong?" Uh, evidently, uh, nothing. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I've dispelled the rumor. I feel like I should like knock on some wood right now. But. Well, I want to uh, I want to give a, th- a thank you to all the people that checked out some of our coverage over the weekend in Montreal. We did a, a number of interviews while you were there that you can check out on the YouTube channel. Some uh, some wonderfully put together videos by One Way Ting. Uh, we did rewind to SmackDown on Friday night after attending SmackDown and then covering Elimination Chamber on Saturday night, where there was a lot going on this weekend, and we will uh, discuss. Have you? Did you go back and watch anything over the past uh, twenty four hours that you were uh, curious to see? I rewatched the main event right before we uh, watched Raw because um, I hadn't actually seen it. Like, I had heard it plenty, but I did not actually see it. So I got to watch it on TV for the first time. It was like watching a whole different match for me. Like, I watched this. It's like I knew the key parts, but there was... If I wasn't, if, if if like six months from now I sat down and watched this, I'd be watching it completely fresh. Like it was, yeah, it was totally a different experience watching it. It was, 
it was a pretty great match and yeah. the crowd heat was incredible that obviously was conveyed to us where we were and for those that did not hear we were set up in an area during the main event where we were taken from our seats with the other media members to this corridor to get ready for the press conference and thus we're on the floor and behind all of these people that are standing there's no screens in the arena so it was us just trying to peer over to see what is going on but we missed all the stuff the interaction with sammy and his wife roman and his wife that was all lost on us so i was glad to watch it and get a more complete picture of the match it was it was an interesting rewatch in in that you had this unbelievable crowd and that one haluva kick near fall was just incredible and you know what the ending is and i was kind of curious just to hear how it comes off on television it was a very deflating end when that three count was made and that audience it was they were not this wasn't a like oh we're gonna riot reaction it was just a oh yeah I, um, so, I mean, for, you know, I got to watch it actually, you know, with my eyes for, for the first time. I mean, I, I want to correct myself. With my I feel, eyes. I feel like I, I did see the match, but I saw half the match. When I say half the match, I don't mean I saw half of it in terms of duration. I mean, I literally saw everything above the second rope and nothing else below the second rope from my vantage point. So I, I literally got to see half of it from the second rope up. So obviously a lot of it was not conveyed to me, but you know, it was also beyond actually getting exposed to the actual match. I, it was a chance to relive that final moment of that three count. And afterwards, I don't know if I kind of saw like such a big hush um, like what immediately came to my mind was when the undertaker lost to Brock Lesnar, you know, it was that same sort of like shock yet also more so disappointment in this case. But I would say shock as well, because I think this entire arena was convinced that they might have done something different than I think what we all expected going in. That's a Sami Zayn lost loss. Um, personally, I think I, you know, having like a few days to think about it, like I, you recognize that it's the right decision, but at the same time, I do feel like there was a way that you could have framed it so that it created a bit more of a satisfying conclusion um that than what they did like what they did i think felt a, a little bit um on paper i think it was fine but i feel like in execution it didn't live up to the incredible crowd momentum and maybe they didn't expect it to be even as big as it was do you think people would have left satisfied or ultimately still disappointed if they had decided do this win in Montreal with the idea that Reigns gets the title back before WrestleMania. Sorry, you're saying if the crowd would be as deflated if they did if, that? Not so much the Montreal crowd, but I mean just the audience in general that sees a, a short Sami Zayn title reign, very much like Mick Foley winning in, in Worcester that year when the plan mm -hmm. was Rock and Austin, but they did a bunch of title flips in between that period. But we're just talking about one here. Or do yeah. you feel that it was – you had to make the hard decision. We're either – it's it's one of these guys has to beat Roman and be our champion moving forward. I, I think that's one of several directions they could have gone to, John. I mean, this is professional wrestling where we've seen a million different, you know, variations of a similar goal, you know, and that's to basically um, maybe crown somebody ahead of getting to an actual main event. I mean, they could have done a dusty finish. They could have done, you know, oh, how appropriate this year. That's that's right. Yeah, they could have they could have you know uh, created some sort of disputed finish that ultimately led to Co Cody a comes out with the rule book to Adam Pierce. <laughs> yeah, that's it, exactly. Um, but they chose not to, I, and I, I like any of the of those other options. I think might have created at least a bit more of a sort of in doubt slash maybe satisfying in, in many ways um, a finish that would have kept Sami Zayn alive in this title chase. Um, but you know. What, what what's done is, is done um and and they're choosing to go ahead with his next storyline and that seems to be this tag team with kevin owens which we will discuss uh and, and we will assess at least you know after tonight whether or not it feels like it's a, it's a satisfying um, replacement for Sami Zayn. yeah yeah I, w I would say that it was still overall like these 32 minutes i found like it breezed by because this crowd was so electric i mean for four and a half minutes they're just staring there and feeding off the energy of the crowd um 
And and th- that was the period we were in our seats. So the, the parts where they weren't moving and just standing there where we could have watched from the second rope and above, uh, that was the part we were in our seats for. And then uh, and then we're gone once the uh, the Topecon heroes start uh, coming out. But it's it was an unbelievable crowd, a tremendous uh, re- reception, of course, for Sami Zayn. And that did extend to Ottawa on Monday. So we'll get into uh, more of that a little later on. Wanted to talk uh, a bit about... Um, the Pew family, because we did get a, an update over the weekend about the late Jay Briscoe's daughters, uh, Jay Lee and Gracie. So uh, this has been coming from a uh, Josh Wharton and uh, the other individual's name who I, I don't have here, um, but they are the two that have been doing all their their video updates uh, in the community and noting that uh, it was over a week ago that uh, Jay Lee had. Uh, been discharged from the hospital. She had her neck brace removed and she's going to be in a back brace for another four weeks. Uh, but it se- seems like a very strong prognosis for her. Uh, Gracie, who is the one that was having the difficulty with, with the feeling below her knee, she still is having trouble with, with feeling there, but she was discharged a couple of days ago and she's going to need outpatient care five days per week. And that was to start today. And she's having normal feelings in both legs and is even doing some walking with assistance. So they're still hoping for more movement below the knee, but they're they're over they're very um seems very optimistic of where they are. This is a month removed from this uh, devastating car wreck. So that is at least some good news that has come out of this regarding the uh the two daughters. Terrific news. Absolutely. You know, and they're all at home they're, they're at home now. So yeah, considering how grave, like you know, those injuries had it beforehand, um, I I hope physically, you know, these two girls are as you know um, healthy as they can possibly be coming off of something like this. Because I mean, you know, the road to recovery is 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 beyond you know the physical for them. So um, I, I'm wishing them all the uh, all the strength. Absolutely. How familiar way were you with Richard Belzer? Beyond. I think, um, order. yeah, and maybe like, you know, freak, like some, some guest appearances on shows here and there. I, I never, like, I think I was too young for the Richard Belzer show, but like, you know, I, I kind of know him through, you know, obviously the, the whole Hogan thing and, and things like that. But it was yeah. interesting. Like Richard Belzer was a, a comedian and host that I did not follow too much. And so many of his contemporaries I did, but Richard Belzer was not somebody I followed too much. In fact, I would guess my introduction to him was when I was in high school and I had sent away for a comp tape, not of wrestling matches way, but of wrestling news stories on a VHS that I got. And it was just all the different like uh, entertainment tonight, doing a feature on the Von Erich family. Um, That would have been um, the Geraldo episode with Rita Chatterton, like just all of these news segments from that period. And on that tape was hot properties. Uh I feel like that's that's like your you know super J cup or like that's like the thing that's your like WrestleMania ten like it's it's the show that inspired you to become who you are. In in my yeah. defense, my very first tape I ever ordered was a Super J cup from ninety five, but this was maybe in that second batch. What I ordered was like all the uh, the the, the news segment, and it was uh, like an hour of these like five minute news pieces on like these you know tabloid magazine shows covering wrestling. But it had the segment with Richard Belzer, Hulk Hogan, and Mister T, and I was curious to see how much of this. In a lot of the write-ups on Richard Belzer passed away over the weekend, for those that maybe are are not familiar. He was 78 years old, and it was like a fairly known story attached to Richard Belzer. And the story was from March of 85. This is days before the first WrestleMania event, and Hulk Hogan and Mr. T are doing all of the media rounds, and they do Richard Belzer's show. It was a short-lived show called Hot Properties, and... It's about a 25-minute segment, and uh, David Bixenspan actually has the entire segment that he has uh, tweeted out, and I did retweet it if you want to go watch the whole thing. And so, of course, this is 1985. They are very much in character, and this isn't too far removed from the 2020 debacle with John Stossel, so you have that sort of in people's purview. So the interview is, you can see Mr. T has no desire to be here on this show and to be doing this media. And he gets set off early on when Richard Belzer, who's pretty much like a like a wise-ass comedian who's just, you know, 
he's he's making his jokes along the way and he refers to the eight uh a team as a violent show sort of in a joking manner and mr t did not seem to take that um in stride and then eventually hulk hogan is out and bells are sort of prodding him on to do a wrestling hold on him mr t wants no part of these wrestling holds it's as though this guy is um seeing into the future of uh i am not getting physical here with anyone hogan on the other hand is like sure why not so he takes him over onto the onto the set and he applies pretty much like a front chancery here like a standing guillotine and he tells belzer to tell him when that when he feels the pressure and you see belzer's hands go out and then boom he plops down to the floor and it is a violent fall that Belzer has and everyone is shocked at this because this is this is not just like a prat fall or some you know uh skit that they're playing like you can the thud was it's pretty alarming and boom as uh, like 10 seconds later Belzer pops up to his feet looks into the camera throws to commercial break and then he turns around and he's got all this blood coming down the back of his head from the landing and they go to commercial and come back, and now there is a producer in Belzer's seat, and he is going over this and talking to Hogan, who Hogan comes off very apologetic and is explaining as though, you know, in wrestling, I, I barely put any pressure on these guys, but Richard Belzer is not, um, he's not a professional wrestler, and he doesn't know what, he's not athletic, and I'm not saying that to uh, be rude to him, but, um, and then Mr. T just takes over. Mr. T has um, very little sympathy for what has just happened in front of him. And he just explains, this is real. You've got these people like John Stossel out there. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this media. Roddy Piper, Cowboy Bob Orton, Paul Orndorff, they're training. They're not doing media. They're not doing interviews. This stuff is real. I've got to be ready. The world champion here. Guess what? He could do this to anybody. And it actually turns into a hell of a promo for WrestleMania 1. Hulk Hogan, in his his eyes are just spinning because he's thinking already of the potential legal fallout of this. And this is not a good... Uh this is not a good look. Mr. T is just uh, dead set on selling mania here, but it's it's quite the bizarre segment to watch. And it did lead to a lawsuit being filed by Belzer against Vince McMahon, the World Wrestling Federation, Hogan. And it went on for years. And then right before it was going to go to trial, they reached a, an out-of-court settlement that was uh, rumored to be in like the, the $400,000 range but he had sued for five million but that was the story and it was a pretty famous segment at the, at the time in in 1985 and and did it help wrestlemania i don't think that one really had it, the big one was hogan and mr t there was um i'm forgetting who it was that pulled out as the host of snl but they lost their host and those two got inserted so the night before wrestlemania they host saturday night live i would say that was the most effective promotion they got in the in that week leading up because the, the week of wrestlemania there were something like 70 different closed circuits that had that had just canceled wrestlemania because of poor advances it was like the week of you were not knowing if this was going to be a big success and they they caught a lot of momentum that week so um yeah but th this you know it was it was on pre people's uh um on their it was a major news story at the time and then the lawsuit coming out of it so there you have it and probably a good rule of thumb for wrestlers to not be doing physical stuff with a with, with uh, television hosts, but this stuff always continued, and then you saw it in MMA as well. Like guys, yeah. every there was always the host that oh p choke me out and all that. Like that stuff is not uncommon, yeah, and it's. I, I would say it's a good idea for a host to not challenge the you know um, masculinity of a professional wrestler or a professional combat sports anything on yeah. TV. Yeah, but th this stuff would always continue. I mean. Uh, Landsberg even did it. Or Regis Philbin would do it. Like these hosts, it was always the go to for the hosts of, oh, put me in a hold or, or something like that. It seems that maybe, maybe things have graduated uh, past that. Uh, we wanted to uh, revisit everything involving uh, Ariel Hawani over the weekend because he, you know, this, this was a pretty significant story over the weekend after he appeared on SmackDown doing a pair of live hits at the Bell Center and then returning on Saturday night for the Elimination Chamber where he appeared on the kickoff show and then during the actual event uh, seated next to George St. Pierre and being introduced by Michael Cole. Um, we should 
probably rewind to Friday because where this became a bigger story was after his appearance on SmackDown, Tony Khan uh, tweeting at Ariel Hawani, insulting him for essentially essentially calling him a uh, a fraud and you're as legitimate of a reporter as Tony Schiavone. And then Ariel came back insulting Tony Khan, which apparently went over very big backstage at WWE and then uh, Tony Khan getting in the last word there. So after this insult, uh, we had Michael Cole introduce Ariel on Saturday as the unbiased Ariel Helwani, who asks all the hard questions, whether you want to answer them or not. So this was the one of one of the big stories over the weekend. There was a lot of criticism levied at both Tony Khan and Ariel Hawani for different reasons, uh, but also calling into question Ariel Hawani taking a role like this with WWE as a very prominent journalist. And he did address it today on the MMA Hour and stating the fact that he believes that there there is a line that he is a mixed martial arts reporter and does not classify himself as a pro wrestling journalist. He is not. Now, that said, he has reported pro wrestling news stories a- as well. So I, I do think like it, it does somewhat cloud the issue. Like last month when the the, the Saudi Arabia story was, was being rumored, I mean, Ariel was one that dispelled that report and a lot of people went with him because of his standing that he has among people. And that was cited as one of the, the key reporters that was denying a sale. I would say, you know, beyond like maybe strict, like here's the news type of like reporting. I think it calls into question like interviewing and, and whether or not that is considered journalism, especially the type of interviewing that Ariel does, you know, like just even the Tony Khan interview itself, asking him to, you know, give us information about the CM Punk, you know, a uh, uh, f- uh, fight. Like, is that a is that journalism? I would argue it is. Um, I would too. And and so, does Ariel get to dictate whether or not that is a journalistic interview? Yeah, I would. Like, we should we should like specify. And it's like Ariel has done. Um, like, this is not the first weekend that we're talking about him. Like, diving into professional wrestling and you know do, doing things. It. It probably this was the furthest I think that he has ever gone into a pro wrestling space. But he has he has popped up, you know, sending videos onto Impact. He has even sent in stuff that has aired on Dynamite in the past, going back a few years. Uh, he has done pre-show panels for WWE slash NXT. But this, I, I think, certainly, and he also disclosed on the show today he was paid for this past weekend, which he was not for last year when he did a voiceover ahead of a Daniel Cormier refereeing at Extreme Rules. But he believes that he is not a pro wrestling reporter and thus um, he's going to do this. And he said he he loved doing it. I mean, my thing is that I, I feel that it's understanding that in professional wrestling, I think that like news reporting, he has to divide that and you know he does have sources in that company and has reported news i think now it's like if you have to make a choice between the two he has clearly made a choice and is open to doing more with wwe he's open to doing stuff with aew he is going to do it he says he enjoys it and he is not going to have anyone online dictate to him what he is going to choose for for his career and Mm. and that's certainly going to bring about a debate from people yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, one of the key parts I would say about it is that he, up until this weekend, was a free agent, I suppose, in this sort of like hosting sort of like a uh, role that he has in professional wrestling. And that's sort of like the, the stance that he's taken. He, he, after this weekend, he still remains a free agent. This was just sort of like a one weekend thing. Um, you know, you, you and I talked a lot about this. Uh, we talked about it on Friday. Um, we talked about it off air. You know, because it's it's a it's a topic that I think directly affects us. It's a topic that you know um, I think we've discussed several times. Um, and you know, from from what you have told me, it, it seems like this. When I ask you whether or not you would do this, you said you you wouldn't. But obviously, you're not Ariel Hawani, and Ariel Hawani isn't you. Um, so I, I, I again, it, it it's is it okay? Is wrestling close enough to MMA that like 
you can separate this much? Maybe the answer is yes. Um, but again, you call into question whether or not Ariel Hawani is a pro wrestling journalist. He says he isn't, but are his actions up until this point that of a pro wrestling journalist? And again, up until this point, uh, up until this weekend, he was a f he was not a, a, a associated with the WWE. At least he was not paid by the WWE. Um, this weekend he was. Does that affect his ability to be unbiased afterwards, after this weekend? Um, I I would say beyond maybe his association with with WWE um, in this role this weekend, maybe it, it's probably like the beef with Tony, the public beef with Tony that has probably like made it difficult, you know, for me to, um, I guess, trust his opinion when it comes to like. Yeah. And, and let me say, I, I, I really did not like, you know, some of the, the comments and, you know, you can argue that, okay, Tony, Tony started it and he fought back. And that's something that Ariel has done with, with a lot of people that have come at him is he has, but, but, fought. but, but who started it? I mean, who really started it? I guess that even that could be debated, right? They, they right. Had if you're going to, to the fallout of, of the interview, certainly like the, this did not just come out of nowhere. There was existing issues based off the interview and Ariel's response to the interview on on his show. He was not happy with the interview. And and that comes down to as well that you, the the viewer, you, the follower of any of these shows, like, what do you want? Do you want um I, I can tell you 1000% those were Ariel's legitimate feelings about that interview. Do you mm -hmm. want that kind of transparency when an interview goes terribly and they come on? And do you want just a, a cookie cutter, no addressing of it? Some might not want that response. Others probably appreciate the candidness of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think you and I having this, like, I, I don't like covering other media people. I don't feel that's in my purview. I don't feel that's what I'm covering here, but there are some stories that I feel do need this discussion and and thus we're having it. And people are going to have different opinions, and I'm also not naive to the point that the modern media is changing rapidly. There are many uh, struggling reporters out there. There are str people like with uh media companies that you have to be very creative and opportunities are going to come your way. Now, Ariel is not someone that is is struggling, but if you don't think like this is the way media is going, where you are going to have these potential conflicts and that there is nothing um, that is going to be viewed by your audience as compromising, like there's just going to be more and more of that. I think you and I are at kind of the, the further end that, that we have like turned down things, but at the same time, like we have advertising on on our show, that is something I um, have. Like we that, we also that... give we also give opinion. Like we're also we're not just you know here to to like you know give out news. Um, and when you give out opinion, um, you're going to potentially run into even more conflict, as Ariel has here in giving his opinion about Tony Khan and given his opinion about AEW, he has, um, you know, found himself in a situation where I think his credibility for those opinions are being called into question because of what what was a future association with the WWE. Um, so now going forward, if he has another opinion about AEW, I mean, this is going to be it's going to be questioned because of this association. And and he seems fine with it. He he, he does like, like this is this is not a, a case where somebody is sort of uh doing this and then maintaining that hey i'm i'm an unbiased pro wrestling reporter like he's a, i am not a pro wrestling reporter and and he is just upfront about what he is doing uh with all of this um to me like i i i did not like the response that he had to to tony khan on on friday um and and i didn't like you know the yeah the way so, on, so on specific, the specifically we should say what you are not in favor of like of the response i mean he he came back and made the the snowman line which is to, is to me like it's i i found that to be one where it's you know it, it, it's it's an allegation that i just think it's one that to me was i just didn't like it i i did not think it I, i'm the same yeah i i, I think that just, just kind of crosses the line you know um 
And I but, also didn't like the line on, on the show today. Just and, and you can see, like, this is obviously kind of the the internal description when he referred to Tony Khan as the kid, and uh, like right out of the, like the Nick Khan uh, playbook. And mm. uh, I mean, this is one where like we talked about Nick Khan referring to Tony Khan as the kid. Um, th- th- this is like two people that are identical ages um, that that we're talking about. But obviously, like that's probably the internal term that they have for Tony Khan. But I mean, um, like that's. He is clearly open to working with, with WWE mm-hmm. and um and that's cool. Like that's I mean that, that, I think that's it's awesome. Like it's it's a dream of his. You know, to- clearly. Like this is something where he is stating that uh I want to do this. It was a great moment for me and I'm not going to let those online dictate it for me. And mm-hmm. th- there is a part of me that I think for many people they would be greatly benefited by not judging or dictating their actions based on how uh, people are going to react online. Now, at the same time, I it, it, it is tough for me to see Ariel, who is, you know, in in this world of MMA, it is very much down the line in this sense. And he would never do this with any MMA promotions. And in pro wrestling, it's obviously he sees that that line and it's it, it's a difficult one. But he hmm. I just think it comes down to um the fact that I, I don't think he can report on pro wrestling stories from this point onward, and he has in the past. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, you know, like he he's a freelancer for hire, and and does one weekend of work for WWE preclude him from giving his opinions, or at least like you know us looking thinking of his opinions on you know any wrestling company as unbiased. Obviously, it, ultimately, it's for the audience to d- decide. And I mean, there have been a lot of opinions about this entire thing. Um, and a lot of it's not like he is hiding sides. any of this either. So it's, no. it's, it's, it's for the audience to decide. You're right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, they seek out his opinions. He is a influential voice that is above a great percentage of the fighters he covers. I mean, his mm-hmm. uh, when you look at his following, um, I am surprised more fighters don't come at him because of the attention that he brings when he does put his spotlight on and has these feuds with these fighters like it has this combative version of Ariel Hawani it's been very effective for his for for his uh, standing with people they love this um I I think at times it just it it does go too far for, for for me like I I am there because Ariel is a great journalist and reporter. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's like he has had a lot of success doing this that, that people respond to. Um, and and yeah. now he's like fully embracing it in professional wrestling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, like you mentioned, John, like I think these sort of media roles um, can be very complex, you know, now, especially when you're somebody in as varied sort of like um, – outlets as an Ariel Hawani who who does the reporting who does the interviewing who does um uh, showtime you know um 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 uh, hosting and and who does a, a live stream of, of a show where he essentially kind of talks as himself um I you know I I I will continue to uh trust I think um the MMA sources that I I get from him I I will continue to respect him as somebody you know who's at the very top of a certain industry that we're associated with um but i i i I will like question the next time i hear perhaps an opinion because of this association about wrestling in in particular i i also found it interesting the way he described sort of the the play-by-play of what was going on friday night when tony khan made the tweet and then you know, he's going backstage at the Bell Center and he's getting ready for his next hit. And then when he fires off the response to Tony and everyone's going crazy backstage, they're high fiving him. And I'm just imagining this. And it's listen, I understand the the group mentality of and we, we don't know. You know, he's not obviously naming names, but if you're thinking of I don't care if you're wrestlers, if you're employees with WWE, I don't care what you're 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 projecting backstage in front of everybody else that AEW is the enemy. If you're a wrestler and truly believe that, I think you're out of your mind that you would ever want this company to fail. Mm -hmm. That you have lived through um, a WWE that how many jobs were uh, cut over uh, I, I should say contracts that were uh, re- released over the last number of years that why why would you ever cheer on um 
this this company uh, torpedoing. Right. Now, does celebrating perhaps, you know, what, what might be construed as a public win because you have, you know, a top journalist fighting on your side, like, does that mean you don't want competition? Or is it simply saying like, hey, that's one for our team and, what, you know, minus one for their team? All I'm saying is that I, I hear so much of, of different wrestlers and they all complain about like the tribalism online and please tell me that the tribalism doesn't also exist oh, among them, probably more so than anyone online. The who, tribalism so, is a function of the system that was created here, you know? And, and like, these companies thrive off of it as of well. Course. Like they yeah. like fans love this stuff. They love it mm -hmm. and they're going to love the fact that we're talking about this. It's as part well. of the function. Just don't get carried away with it, everybody. You know, don't don't get into personal attacking. Don't troll people on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll just I'll just end. And obviously, like I'm trying to be as balanced here. I'm very upfront. Ariel's been a close friend of mine going back uh, to 2007. So we said know, hi and to him at uh, on Saturday. We we did. We saw him on Saturday. He had a great joke about him, uh, you know, uh, about to step into the press conference panel to be interviewed. I thought it was hilarious. Like I will say this: that Ariel has. Um, he mentioned this in his whole show today that you know he was constantly referring to the fact that the old Ariel would have reacted this way and this would have like ruined his night and such. Mm -hmm. That guy, I can tell you. Quite honestly, he has dealt with a lot of shit in his career, stuff that uh, I'll be frank, if a fraction of it had happened to me, I probably would be out of the industry. There are not too many people that could be that excommunicated from a Dana White that could survive in this industry. And if you mm -hmm. don't think Dana White has taken great actions to prevent work, uh, money for Ariel Hawani of different jobs that he has stopped Ariel from having, um, it's it's a remarkable fact that he has made it to this part of his career. So do I understand him having this chip on his shoulder that Ariel is not going to be bullied? And that to me is very clear, whether it is a fighter, whether whether it is a promoter, whether it are is fans, he is not going to be bullied. And you might not like that tact. I, I don't always like it when he takes that tact and, and goes that direction. But he has also gone through stuff that I could not imagine. And frankly, I don't think my career would have survived going through. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely understand. I understand like somebody who's been bullied for a long time wanting to stand up for himself. I guess just have to be careful that you don't become the bully yourself. Well, there you have it. There is our, uh, our, our thoughts on one of the big stories of the weekend. Um, like a postcard right there at the end. Well, did you see any of Battle in the Valley way on a lighter note? I saw the Mercedes match. I saw the I saw the Eddie Kingston Jay White match. I love that Eddie Kingston Jay White match. I saw the I saw the top three. I, I saw Kingston White and then the final two matches on uh, on Sunday night. Uh, Kingston and Jay White. Dude, I thought I thought Jay White was amazing in this match. Yeah. Um, Kingston, I was really impressed. Kingston with, was amazing. Kingston was great too. But man, I'm just watching Jay White here, and I mean. I, I've been a big fan of this guy more than than most, and I just feel like of late, um, it's all clicking for him, and I just thought he was awesome here. And the end of this, where he was finally baby-faced in front of this audience, and he falls after two Northern Lights bombs, uh, absorb multiple uh, hurricanes, and th they just had a great match. 19 minutes, 8 seconds, and then Kingston beats him. He applauds Jay White. The crowd is, thank you, Jay. Kingston doesn't want the camera on him. He wants it on Jay White in the ring. And then as Jay White goes, and he's finally going to give a a heartfelt speech to the audience. He's drilled by a shillelagh by David Finley, who lays out his former young lion stablemate. And David Finley cuts the promo of his life that Jay White had this company by the balls and he let it go. He would have killed for what Jay White has. And now I'm going to kill for it. Fuck your era. Fuck California. And he says that my people have been here for four generations and this was the, big... the whole thing was that like he he felt like an, he feels like a loner and an outsider no matter where he is in America. He's too Irish in Ireland. He's too American in Japan. He's a guy. So he's he, he resents everybody. 
Yeah, and makes him instantly one of the favorites, I feel, for the New Japan Cup. I was going like El Fantasmo, but I think David Finlay will be a, a real... Uh, he's got Ishii in the first round. I think that's a guaranteed win for David Finlay, but he probably goes far in, in this tournament. It was a great promo. This was a big statement from New Japan. You know, Jay White is, you know, a multi-time like a champion, Wrestle Kingdom headliner, and for his final moment in the promotion to be with a David Finlay is... A bit of a you know a significant sort of passing of the torch you know for that sort of top heel type of role um he sounded great man like finley you know um like good enough to, despite him wanting you know being a loner I, I think he's good enough to be a faction leader um i don't like who do you think replaces jay white as bullet club leader oh gosh i hope the bullet club just maybe ceases at this point. maybe they call it a day we've we've had a good I, 10 years kind of doubt it I feel like they still sell some some t-shirts maybe well but um but I, i'm not necessarily suggesting Finley, but like I, i'm saying he his he sounds good enough you know to lead his own faction yeah Kyrie and mercedes monet for the iwgp women's championship uh mercedes came out with a a hanakamura tribute outfit yeah. uh, this looked amazing it looks i mean it, it, it was awesome and i would say Unfortunately, like the last image that I think a lot of us had late leading up into this this match was like a bit of a fumble. I mean, not a bit, like a, a fumble of a segment, I would say, at Wrestle Kingdom between the two of them. So um, the moment she came out here dressed as Hata Kimura, I mean, I forgot all about that Wrestle Kingdom segment. You know, I, I, I think to pay tribute this way, um, first of all, looked awesome. And secondly, I think it added a great deal of weight, you know, to this match with her and Kyrie. Uh, Her Karen Peterson in in a write up on our site, I, I think, terrifically puts it. But you know, essentially, it's that um, there's a lot of significance here because you know, for Kyrie Sane, because she, from my recollection, was one of the first stardom attached people to to find out about the Hanakamura tweets um, because she happened to be living in the U.S. at the time. Um, that plus like, you know, uh, Hana being, or Sasha being, you know, one of Hana's, um, favorite wrestlers, uh, just basically all of that combined was, um, I think added a lot of emotional weight to what was already a pretty hyped up match. Yeah. They, they went almost 27 minutes. Uh, they had a fantastic match. Uh, the audience was with them the whole way. Uh, one of the big spots was a, uh, was a power bomb through a table uh, by, by the stage, which was uh, just looked incredible as uh, Mercedes was put through the table. Big chant of Kyrie, and you had uh, Mercedes doing the, the various Eddie tributes throughout. And uh, Kyrie gets her knees up for the frog splash, and then it, it's Kyrie with her own version of the bank statement that Mercedes has been using that was just identified as a crossface. So maybe we need to come up with a. Uh, uh, a, a name of some sort. Crossface doesn't really cut it, does it? Yeah, I guess. Um, how many money puns can there? I mean, they're they're limitless, really. I mean, so. now that you've got her with 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 Okada, I mean, they're just going to have to. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a license to print money. Uh, Monet then bites herself free, and then they have their arms locked together, and Monet gets her up on the back and into the money maker, and a much better execution of the move this time around. Twenty six forty seven. Excellent match. This this could have closed the show, although the way they ended the show, I didn't really have too much of an issue with the way the match order of with what they went. But if you were someone that was really pushing for the women to close the show, um, they had the better match than Okada Tanahashi, in my opinion. Hmm. And certainly um, people were in this building to see this match. I mean, they sold out this building before uh, Tanahashi and Okada was announced. But um ultimately all you're looking for i think is a great result that people are talking about it positively and and i i think these two ultimate like yeah like the segment at wrestling kingdom didn't turn out great but what matters in the end is the quality of the match and this match absolutely delivered you know it felt like it was a spectacle it felt like you know um it felt like a great like reintroduction for mercedes Monet. And then Okada Tanahashi, which uh, I'm never going to get tired of these two. They can have their match at Wrestle Kingdom 38, and I will watch it, and I'll enjoy it. Um, these two, it, they went 21 minutes, and this was sort of like going to see, um, you know, your, uh, some, some classic band, and you're going to some stadium event to watch them, and they're going to play their greatest hits. It's not, uh, it's not 1998. 
but it's still uh, reminiscent of a great time in, in your life that, that you remember that they can throw back to. And quite honestly, in their sleep, they're still going to have a, a pretty kick-ass match here. And uh, Tanahashi, this was big enough for him. Uh, high fly flow to the floor. I mean, the man, what more could you ask for him? Um, working on Okada's knee throughout the match, so that played into things. Okada held on to the wrist, and the ace is high gets met with an Okada drop kick in midair, and this prompts Okada to roar in the air. Rainmaker gets countered by a small package, and for a second, this audience believed Tanahashi's getting one more run with this belt, but no. Uh, Insiguri by Okada, uh, Cobra Flosion, and then the Rainmaker winning this match, 21 minutes and nine seconds. So um, this one's not gonna rank too high in the comparisons of other Okada-Tanahashi matches, but that's a that's a hell of a standard to meet. Um, I still enjoyed this match. I'm always gonna enjoy these two uh, having uh, a match. I think having it in front of a US crowd automatically kind of freshens it up, makes it different. Like you said, John, it's like, I don't know, seeing... Uh, 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 you know, like Metallica, Metallica has played. Um, 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 what, what's that? What's the song they they, they play all, all the time? God, um, Master of Puppets. Yeah, please. They play Master of Puppets. Uh, evidently, like the the most out of any of their songs. But to to go into one market, th- th- this was this was the Saint Anger album. So even <laughs> even right? even Saint Anger, it's like it's still Metallica. My point was like you know Metallica has played Master of Puppets seemingly everywhere, but they ha- have they ever played it in Markham, Ontario? Okay, I'm willing to bet no. So the first time they play it in Markham, Ontario, it's going to be very significant, and maybe that's what Okada Tanahashi was. And then Okada addressing the crowd in English, and he wants to. Bring back the dream team with Tanahashi, and they want to become tag champions. So Tanahashi's down, and they are going to challenge Okada's fellow Chaos stablemates, Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi Bishimon, on March the 6th at the anniversary card uh, at Oda Ward Gymnasium. And I would think Okada and Tanahashi winning the tag titles is probably pretty likely, as they discuss the next morning over breakfast. You think so? Why? I think wouldn't that, that this... wouldn't that ice the uh, world title? No, not necessarily. Hmm. Okay. I, th- I think you could have Okada, you know, do this dual role. I think it would really bring up the the tag titles, and I would not put Okada and Tanahashi together just to lose, mm. even if it's Tanahashi okay. taking the fall. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we shall see. We shall see. So, and um... then Mercedes came out at the end, and she thanks the crowd and says the two of them are the true uh, dream team and uh, posed with their titles. And that's how the, the show concluded. So, I mean, I didn't... Li- so sorry, sorry, just to cut you off, but you know, just talking about this, this scene here, I mean, first of all, what a great looking set of uh, champions, uh, the two of them, you know, and I think for new Japan at a time where they're trying to reset and recapture a lot of the audience's attention to have this be the lasting image, I, I think is a very positive, you know, close of the night for new Japan pro wrestling. And uh, the last match I want to talk about from this weekend that uh, I heard great things about, so I want to check it out, and that was Kento Miyahara against Yuji Nagata for the Triple Crown. And uh, this match got a lot of great reviews on Sunday, so when I'm watching it, like, um, Yuji Nagata, I mean, even at his age, I mean, he can turn it up. He's, you know, a, a few... He's definitely, he's a step or two short, uh, slower than even, you know, a couple years back. But for this match at Cora Kewen Hall... Uh, It's going along, and it's a really nice match, and and it's building and building. But I'm watching this, and I'm like, it's not like match of the year territory. And then this final, like, five minutes starts, and suddenly, dude, it's like 1995 at Budokan Hall, and you've got some red-hot All Japan Triple Crown Championship match. Miyahara's going for the shutdown. It's countered to a Fujiwara armbar, and Nagata's eyes are rolling back. But Miyahara is still able to make it to the rope. He hits the uh, the blackout knee, and all all um, match long, Nagata's been working on this arm to weaken it for the the Fujiwara armbar. So Miyahara is doing an excellent job of selling this arm. He'll hit the lariat, but it's worth the risk to try and put down the old man. He hits the shutdown German, and Nagata kicks out. Now, this is not a, a flawless uh, finisher when it comes to its protection, but it's it's pretty damn rare when they have someone kick out of the shutdown. So this was a pretty significant near fall. So he goes for another one. Nagata blocks, and Miyahara, like, checks the kick, and there's an exploder for a massive near fall on Miyahara, and it's at this point you realize 
Like, I know the result going into this. I'm like, they are going to lose their minds when Nagata wins this. And he lands a head kick and the backdrop hold. And when he pins Miyahara, dude, this crowd, this would have, this is what it would have been like with 1,400 people at the Bell Center for Sami Zayn instead of uh, the, uh, the, the 14,000 or so. Dude, this crowd, they lost their minds that Nagata won this match. They were not expecting Nagata to win the title here. 2306. And the way this climaxed, it was. Uh, like when it comes to peaking a match, Kento Miyahara might be in a class of his own. Like it's it's Okada territory when it comes to uh, nailing the landing uh, of a match. But I'm I'm all in for this Yuji Nagata title run. He's going to defend against uh, Shuji Ishikawa uh, next month in his first defense, and he becomes the fifth person to hold the Triple Crown, GHC Heavyweight, and IWGP Heavyweight titles in their career. Hmm. Very cool. Is it is it a match of the year contender in your eyes? It, it it's up there. Um, I'm I would not put it at um, like number two or three, but it, it it would probably be top five for me. Just the ending and the crowd reaction, it puts it up a notch or two. Like it it was pretty great. It's again, I feel we always say this on Monday, but you just look back at this weekend and it's like <laughs> the wrestling we got this weekend. Like you got uh, the Mercedes match, this Kento Miyahara match, the Zayn and Reigns, and it's. This is not a, a an odd weekend either. It's like usually every weekend you get you get like one to two of these unbelievable matches. Yeah, shout out uh, Red Raider over at forum.postwrestling.com who is uh, taking it. Yeah, upon this is an awesome to, thread that's going on. They're keeping track to start a 2023 best matches uh, every week thread. So uh, go to forum.postwrestling.com if you feel like you'd like to contribute. He is and others are updating this list every single week. If you're just looking for some great recommendations for what you missed. Last things, um, won't go through the whole card here, but in a couple of hours, actually two hours from now, it's the start of the uh, the Mudo final countdown at Tokyo Dome. Keiji Mudo against Tetsuya Naito. Among the big matches, we've got Okada and Kaito Kiyomiya, which uh, I can't wait for this match. I thought this has maybe been the... Uh, this, along with that Rain Zane build, these have been the best built matches so far uh, two months into the year. Uh, Hiromu Takahashi and Amaksa, that's going to be tremendous. Nosawa wrong guy's retirement uh, on the undercard of another man's retirement. Teams with Mazada against Taiji Shimori and Ghetto. And then Kento Miyahara, Suwama, and Yuma Aoyagi are taking on Noah's uh, Keno, Ketsuhiko Nakajima, and Minabu Soya. So it is all Japan versus uh, Noah. You've got uh, Dragon Gate involvement here. Uh, we have uh, uh, DDT involvement here. Um, just all these promotions that are sending uh, talent for this show. It's uh, 11 matches, I believe, and it starts at 2 a.m. Eastern on Wrestle Universe. Uh, and Way and I will be doing a show Tuesday night for cafe members uh, going over the uh, the whole card, including Keiji Muto, ending his 39-year career. This guy was had his first match weight when you and I were about uh, six months old. Um. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this this is the final retirement. If those of you that are confused, didn't we already talk about um, Muda's last match? We talked about Muda's last match, not Mudo's last match, okay? So this will be the final one uh, for now. Um, but, you know, uh, I think a lot of questions about his health heading into this match against Tetsuya Naito in a main event role at the Tokyo Dome. I mean, last we saw him, he was being wheeled out, out of the arena by um, uh, Darby Allen and from the sounds of it, what, what was it, the MCL or something like that? Hamstring. Hamstring. Okay, well, so um, has he had enough time to recover to deliver a performance that's expected of him? That, does it make you s suspicious that the word last is in quotations on the poster? It's like, last. <laughs> <laughs> last love? Why did they put it in quotes? What the hell? <laughs> Maybe they'll never it, retire, and he's going to call out Ric Flair. <laughs> maybe it means it's the last match on the show, but he never said last match. Are you kidding me? Uh, and then NXT Tuesday night, we've got the Dyad taking on Chase U, Idris Inoufé and Malik Blade against Gallus, Elba Fire versus Ivy Nile, Ilya Dragunov against Trick Williams, JC Jane versus Indy Hartwell, and Braun Breaker defends the NXT title against Jinder Mahal. Uh, those are matches. Dynamite on Wednesday, John Moxley against Evil Uno. The Revolution Tag Team Battle Royal for one of the remaining two spots in the tag title match at Revolution. Orange Cassidy against Wheeler Yuta for the All-Atlantic Championship. The Acclaimed against Big Bill and Lee Moriarty. Soraya against Sky Blue. And drumroll, Tony Khan has a big announcement on Wednesday. Wow. Okay. Here's a question. Um... 
are there any lines either from Tony or on commentary directed towards this Hawani situation or the WWE's, you know, um, commentary? I will say no. But I guess Tony Schiavone say something about his uh, journalistic uh, uh, integrity. You know what? They probably will make a joke about it on commentary. You're right. I was more so thinking like Tony Khan, like making some line, which I would be surprised by. But I can also see Tony Khan wanting to fan the flames of this. I could. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Certainly possible. I I don't like it. I don't like it. But yeah, I could see it. Okay. We'll uh, we'll just uh, wrap up on what is coming up on the site this week. Listen, if you are a brand new member to the Post Wrestling Cafe, have we got a week for you? Do we have one bonus show for you? Do we have two bonus shows for you? Three bonus shows this week? Four bonus shows this week. I barely have enough fingers to count how many bonus shows we have for you this week on the Post Wrestling Cafe. I mean, you're almost you're running on a weekdays, John. We're going to have to create new days to accommodate the great value that the Post Wrestling Cafe brings to you. Starting Tuesday, we will have the Keiji Muto Retirement Show Post Show with myself and Wei. That's up Tuesday night. Thursday, it is the much-anticipated return of MCU later. As Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania will be reviewed by WH Park, Rich Fan, and Scrump. That is coming at you this Thursday. Um uh, I wish I wish I could be there, but I'm not going to get to see it until this weekend. So we're relying on uh, people who could probably talk about quantum physics and science and quantum this and quantum that and Ant-Man especially way better than I can in WH, Rich and Scrum. So I'm really looking forward to hearing those guys. I think they'll we, be live on Thursday too. They will be live on Thursday. So um, you can check that out. Um, next, uh, this Friday, we will have Rewind to SmackDown with Way and Kate from Montreal. She is going to be uh, filling in on Friday because I will be watching uh, No Surrender and then doing a show Saturday with uh, John Ceno. So that is uh, coming out Saturday. And then we've got our regular uh, shows this week, including uh, the NWA podcast. Brandon Thurston and I are releasing another interview, so look out for that later this week. And maybe, Way, in lieu of you being unable to join them on MCU later, if we have time next Monday, maybe we can get a quick review from you on Quantum Mania, and I will provide a quick review of Cocaine Bear. Oh boy! Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Should we just ditch the raw review next week and just talk about those things instead? Cocaine Bear is all I want to hear about. Yeah, really. let's talk about uh, co- cocaine and Quantum Mania together. Uh, as I my- as I make my triumphant return to a, a movie theater, I, I'm hoping wow. that uh, that they have like balloons out for me. I hope I hope they put out the whole welcoming party for me. I'm more curious about that. Your return to to movie theater after what like four years? It's been a long time. Yeah, uh-huh. I haven't gone in years. Postwrestlingcafe.com, video.postwrestling.com for those of you that want to watch these reviews instead of just listen. Yes, always check that out. Tonight, Raw was in Ottawa at, man, the most stereotypical name, the Canadian Tire Center. Is Does Tim Hortons have a, a, an arena? I'm sure they do. They have Tim yeah. Hortons Field. Field, okay. I'm Hamilton. sure they have an arena. I'm sure they'll have a stadium at some point. Yeah, it does a... Uh, uh, the, the Tim Beebs, that should they that should have its own uh, name. I think Schwartz's should have. Imagine they have their own musical. Can, can we uh, let's let's pause the raw review? This is going to be a four hour review. Okay. I've thought about Schwartz's multiple times since we had it on Sunday. It was so good, dude. It was really good. Yeah, it was. Is it was it worth the hype? Yeah, I I've been multiple times, but it's been a long time since I had gone, and I'm so glad we got that in. That was that was the best meal of of the trip. It was very good. And I think a lot of it because of, I think, I don't know, the, the atmosphere and maybe because of like the expectations you put into it as well. We had a chance. The best part of it about it, John, was that we didn't have to wait that long in line. What would you it say, was 20 vi- minutes? We, we walked by Saturday and the line was gigantic. I'm guessing it would have been minimum an hour to wait. So we came back Sunday and we were prepared to wait an hour. We had it in our heads. It's going to be a long wait. And it was it was a pretty, we had to line up for a little bit, but it, it flew by. We got seated. The food comes very quick. I mean, they got their stuff down at Schwartz's. And the lady working, I, I, I thought was pretty helpful. Perhaps 10 out of was- 10. Perhaps 10 out of 10, would. if you want extra bread, she was ready. Like, she was someone, she was going to make sure that all of your desires uh, for food were met. <laughs> yeah, we had suitcases even in a very crowded space, and they put them aside for us. It was very helpful. She sold us on the large plate, but it was, you know, she's, it wasn't upselling because she told us to share the large plate. 
instead of getting our own sandwiches. This is what she really did was just save us some money. So uh, get the large plate. I had enough to take home, and my wife even enjoyed the leftovers. So did we get um, a review? How were the bagels? Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, With the honey you. water. <laughs> honey water. Yeah, av aviateur, I believe. I'm butchering it, I'm sure, but um. I, we we did the most stereotypical Montreal things, uh, except we, you. John, we, we bought all these bagels and and I ate like two of them and I was like left you with almost no, nothing. Oh, th it was enough. Trust me, those bagels saved us at night because we'd get home so late after these shows and we would be doing our shows and there weren't really kind of like any places to there go. There was nothing open near us. Yeah, um, or at least we didn't want to walk far enough to get. Seriously, to it. Schwartz's was number one. My second best meal was that half bagel I had at like 2.30 in the morning, late Saturday night. It was so good, dude, because I was starving, and that yeah. was like the best thing in the world. When uh, uh, And I, I wanted to eat the whole thing, but I felt bad, so I, I only took half. Oh, come on, please. I had already please. nabbed one off you earlier, and I could tell you were just being polite. So These, these bagels are, were good enough to eat like without any like cream cheese or anything on it. Like the, Honestly, they say Oh, yeah, us. just plain, dude. They're yeah. great. They're fantastic. Yeah. So. I, I would say that, you know, we had a very stereotypical diet at, at, in Montreal, but, you know, one person, even though he had an opportunity, did not take it to try Putin. Nope. I, uh, I still remain uninitiated to uh, the craze that is poutine. And I Although can't everybody, I was... you know, speaking of journalism, I learned a little bit more about, you know, John's uh, long-held uh, grudge with, with this food. It's not fries and gravy that he hates. He likes fries and gravy. That's fine. It's the cheese curds. Okay. That's the deal breaker. I don't get it. Why? Do you like cheese on fries? No. No. So 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 you che just cheese alone on fries you don't like. No. I, I don't want that whole concoction. How about at, at cheese all. on nachos? No. I'm not uh... cheese on wait, cheese on nachos? You don't uh, like cheese on nachos is fine. Yeah, cheese on nachos <laughs> is fine. But when it's combined with gravy and potatoes, you it's a no. Yeah. This is not interesting at all. Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. All right. We're an hour into this show, dude. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to uh, condense. Sami Zayn is out. Uh, pretty strong reaction. This was not a Montreal crowd, but it was still, you know, they, they were lively here for, for Sami Zayn at the beginning. And he was very thankful. He had a lot of gratitude. He, uh, he was not feeling strange uh, in, in this promo. He says he feels guilty that he let people down at Elimination Chamber. But the story is never over. But we are entering the final chapter, which would suggest that the story does have an ending, right? If you're entering the final chapter. Um, you're saying, does it suggest that it will have an ending? Yeah. He says the story is never over, but we are entering the final chapter. Right, right. Um, maybe it's a long chapter. <laughs> is this uh, the, like Return of the King? Uh, I guess. I, I never, I've never read those books. He needs to talk to someone, so he calls out Kevin Owens, and Owens comes down, and Zayn thanks him and apologizes, and know, he knows how messy it's gotten. He wants Reigns and the bloodline to come crumbling down. Neither of us could do it on our own, but we could do it together. Owens says, I came out Saturday for my family because they were there seated in the front row, which I can confirm I could see them uh, in, the, in the front row, and... They were there to watch because at the Royal Rumble, they were at home watching me get beaten while you just stood there. So I saved your family that trauma by saving you. And I'm going to keep fighting alone. And if you want a partner, go ask your buddy Jay about taking the bloodline down. And Kevin takes off. Yeah. Um, you know, needless to say, I, I think I was uh, one of many people who left um, Saturday pretty dejected. I, t I didn't even know, think that they would have Sami Zayn on the show. And I, I think it was really good that they did, number one, because it's the final Canadian stop on this tour. And he's got all this, like, goodwill as, like, a Canadian hero at this point. Um, and also because I think it helped Cody. Like, not having Zayn on the show, I think would have maybe built even more resentment towards Cody. As of tonight, like, there, there seemed to be none. Um, and, and I think that's because they gave the crowd a satisfying Sami Zayn segment. Beyond that, I really love the fact that they haven't automatically made the match simply, like the match being Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus the Usos. I'm glad that they didn't automatically make that match simply because they were all baby faces now. You know, oh, this guy's a good guy now. So, of course, he's going to be on the other guy's side. Real life doesn't work that way. You know, the enemy of my enemy is still my enemy. 
in many cases. So um, I think they're choosing to tell this story instead. I mean, yes, there's disappointment that Sami Zayn isn't in the main story heading towards WrestleMania. But if the consolation is a compelling side quest that's full of its own intricate storytelling in this Se uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens dynamic, I'm I'm all in. You know, Andor isn't a main franchise film, but it's miles better than any of the new trilogy. Uh, I know you get that reference, John. So nailed it. Um, <laughs> so you know, it, 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 I saw like you, we discussed whether or not like not doing the hug on Saturday was the right call. I I think we understand why now because they want to tell that story and they want to delay it before finally giving it to us. I I do get that. It's I think it would have been. I think it just would have mitigated a bit of of the audience. But that said, you know, part of the reason. I, you know, you're looking at these numbers and this has been like this story that you want to see what's next each week. And now, like they're not just pairing them together. And now we've got six weeks of we know what the match is. It's this build up to oh, they're building up to that hug. And mm -hmm. and maybe they can tell this over four weeks before you lock things in and and you get there. More importantly, I think people wanted um, to be assured that Sami Zayn was still going to be a focused character on these shows that was still going to receive airtime. He wasn't just going to be put into some sort of like role that 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 feels insignificant. And I think tonight told you that he wasn't. As Zayn was leaving on his own, he gets jumped by Baron Corbin. And after the break, he's cutting a promo while security, including longtime Ontario based independent wrestler rip impact appearing Whoa. on raw yeah that's rip amazing. impact was here yes i didn't realize that's awesome yes uh playing security here uh tending to Sami Zayn and uh corbin just insulted canada and to the point that pierce just sets steps aside and lets Sami Zayn at him so Zayn attacks and we get an impromptu match here where uh, Zayn worked in his uh in his jeans as corbin ripped off his shirt and dude this guy's got marks all over his back he had this nasty cut down his chest at elimination chamber that looks like that that's gonna leave a mark that's like, gonna be a long. What was the spot? I mean, I, know I don't know how, how he got it. Like it looked like someone just whipped him on, on the front of his chest because it was all. It was like Brock Lesnar's tattoo across his chest. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right. Didn't look fun. Like that's gonna sting hmm. for months. If you're gonna um, get a scar from any match, I, I I suppose like that match was the one to get one from. You want to be able to give that story rather than you know I was had a it was a makeshift ring at a bowling alley and I uh, yeah. stumbled out of the ring. Yeah. Haluva kick gets stopped by a clothesline. He tried several haluva kicks and Corbin stopped him. Kicks out of a deep six and then after a clothesline in the corner, Zayn fires out of the corner, hits the haluva kick and wins in nine oh two. Uh huh. James Robinson says uh, the DDT attempt to the floor through the corner turnbuckle. So that, like that threaded DDT, that would make sense. Where yeah, um, that's that right. Where he back. went for and got caught with the uppercut. Wow. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Baron Corbin. Uh, uh, last week he did this for Cody Rhodes. I mean, it seems like facing guys in streetwear seems to be his thing now. Uh, these past two weeks and um, what a I, gimmick. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Y you know because we lived through so many years where it's people like ricochet that would be in this role of like losing you know to the people that are actually supposed to be in these stories i'm not really complaining at all that we're getting baron corbin in this role instead it was a rehab win for zane um and i'm you know it tells you to me that they are still serious about pushing him saxton does a uh, sit down with rhea ripley and dominic and she has unfinished business with beth but she's focused on wrestlemania Dom calls them has-beens, just like his deadbeat dad. And she is the best woman in WWE. She's not going to make the same mistake twice with Charlotte. They have a face-to-face -face this Friday on SmackDown. And Dominic is going to tag along with Rhea because he's heard that his dad has a match on Friday with Karrion Cross. So we're going to get that heated up with Dom and Ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought Rhea sounded pretty good here. You know, um, even delivering an overwritten, unnatural line like... I'll be standing on her crumbled queendom. <laughs> um, You've never even said then, that? She said that, yeah. Even then, I thought she sounded pretty good. Um, I, I think it's very clear to me whose story this is going into the WrestleMania match. Like, people are talking about Rhea Ripley. I, I don't know how much of the focus is, is on Charlotte. And all of this is to say, like, I don't know how they're really going to play this babyface heel dynamic because she's technically the heel here. But, man, Charlotte just does not feel interesting at all. There's a link to an interview in my update today from Charlotte when she was at the Daytona 500 over the weekend. And you can, one of her answers, it's like, 
it's very tough. Like she is a natural heel and she understands mm-hmm. that as well, but she also understands like she is getting some babyface reactions during this run, but it seems it seems like she's very conflicted about her her character and I feel she's probably not going to get much of a say in it. I think the audience is going to lean one way that weekend towards Ripley. Like she's just this great kick-ass character that everyone I think is going to be in front of in the, in this match uh, to get something fresh. Austin Theory is interviewed. He puts over winning the chamber match and then brings up John Cena coming back in two weeks time in Boston on March the 6th. But who cares? And calls Canada crappy and he's never going to lose the United States title. So yes, that news was made earlier today by WWE. John Cena is coming back and presumably to set up his uh, WrestleMania program on the on that show in Boston. Boston, yeah, where he's from. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Dolph Ziggler, Mustafa Ali. At long last, we got the big showdown between these two after weeks and weeks and weeks of segments between these two. Famouser got stopped with a handstand into a crucifix, and Ali pinned him in two minutes and seventeen seconds. Um. <laughs> Yeah, was it that simple? Yeah, I guess so. I, I thought it was a cool counter to the Famouser. It was. And um, I guess this means a rematch? Is um, that what, what uh, you took from it? I take it that they're going to have one more match where the loser has to pose with an open mouth for the next year. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the start of a push for Ali. I find it <laughs> very hard to care. You know, if it's at this level, I mean, both of them just kind of feel like they're, I mean, this should really be reserved for main event. Someone's got to win the Andre Battle Royal, and it's probably not going to be either of these two. It's not. I don't even know if they'll be in it. (laughs) Kathy Kelly is with The Miz and Maurice, and it happens to be their nine-year wedding anniversary. And Maurice presents an envelope to The Miz, and he opens up the envelope, and he's going to reveal the contents on Miz TV next week. But it's great news. It's a gift that is so good. He he needs to let uh, save it for next week. So what could it be, John? Do you think he's hosting WrestleMania or doing something uh, like can that? Can Maurice give him that? How can Maurice buy that for him? Um, or acquire that for him? Maybe uh, you know. It's what, what do you get for your nine year anniversary? I think it's it is. Maybe it's ho- a maybe it's a child. You know, maybe she's announcing her pregnancy and. What else would elicit this sort of reaction? Possible, yeah. So either what? What if it's? Um, wasn't there one year he had to do WrestleMania, and it was right around when she was due, and it was going to be? Within, oh yeah, it was. Yeah. It was that WrestleMania, and yeah. Anyway, well, okay. So you're going with baby. I'm going yeah. with WrestleMania host. <laughs> okay, one. I mean, both. Both very important. Yeah, this is our tease for next week. And then he took credit for molding Logan Paul and is happy that Logan cost Seth Rollins the match last night. Or very uh, Saturday. Yeah, I like that. Cody Rhodes came out. Positive reception for, for Cody. Like, you could certainly look at this segment, and they did not need to put Cody on this show, but they opted to, and there was no kind of negative uh, feedback for Cody. Mm-hmm. He's interrupted by Paul Heyman, who is on the screen in a neck brace selling the stunner. And Heyman's invited to the ring, but instead he says he can't because he was attacked by a Kodiak bear. Is that what he called yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know if that one's going to take off. And he's the victim of the terrible Canadian healthcare system. <laughs> you want to be a heel, you just rail on our healthcare. Says that he cannot beat Roman Reigns and asks Cody, What do you think your life will be like if you win that title? And he runs down. You'll be on the road 200 days a year, 50 days doing charity appearances and red carpets, 30 days overseas, 20 days promoting the big pay-per-views, and then you'll have about 60 days at home, of which half of those will be on Spike calls, which he then corrected himself. We are not on that network anymore. Skype calls. Like Paul, I, do you think they're using Skype in this, in this modern era? Uh, no, Zoom. I feel like has kind of taken over. I think or Google so too. Hangouts. Yes, and he and he compared it to Dustin, stating how Dusty was never home when he was world champion. Is this what you want for your family, Cody? Are you willing to make that sacrifice? And then he says, "I'm not even going to say something offensive right now, like Roman will keep your wife warm 
on on a cold night. No, I'm not going to say that. Or sorry, Roman is a happily married man, so he wouldn't say that. But I'm not. And this line just kind of like I thought it just died. It well, felt so it got no reaction and is, I don't even think anyone Isn't he, isn't he married? I don't believe so. Oh, he's not married. Oh, okay. Well, um I feel uh, that's kind of sad, <laughs> actually. The way he phrased it was like, you know, Roman is really happy in his relationship, but um, I'm, I'm not. Um, but I get it. I get it. I know. Did it die? It was just it was an dead. awkward line that didn't fit to me, and it was, um, I it was kind of threatening. Well, I mean, it was threatening. Of course, it was a threat, but it was like a creepy, which maybe it was meant to be as well. Okay. Cody I, warns Reigns never to send Paul Heyman to him again. We're going to meet soon. He calls Roman the best champion in all of sports. But I must finish the story, and I will beat you at WrestleMania. Is finish the story going to be um, grading by the six weeks from now? They might have, like, maybe they should have compared notes for, for, the, for these two. You know, uh, we got, we got um, what, what's, what's his name? Uh, Will Hobbs also. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of book. a lot of voracious readers in pro wrestling. Yeah, today. a lot of authors. Can you uh, imagine and... uh, Mad Dog Vachon? <laughs> I've got to finish the story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, you know scribes here in professional wrestling. But um, I thought it was overall a good segment for Cody. You know, especially um, he received a good babyface reaction, especially considering what could have been a slightly negative reaction for him. I thought it was they executed movement in the story. Cody is now continually getting more annoyed that Roman is using Paul Heyman to avoid him. I really like the fact that they're positioning Cody as a smart babyface. So often, being smart is a trait reserved for heels like a Paul Heyman, but. The Cody character is presented as smart enough to be able to continually dismiss Paul Heyman's words and his actions and these sort of mental games. Like, you can't handle being a champion. Um, he's not necessarily even pissed at Paul Heyman. He's pissed that Roman is using Paul Heyman instead of, you know, talking to him directly. So I, I like how they're positioning Cody. They're also playing up Paul Heyman almost as the Don King figure where, you know, he's trying to pretty much advertise his services to Cody. Like the reason like Roman does, he's not on the road all these days. Like this is what you're facing without the services of Paul Heyman, who can get you a sweetheart deal. Like I have Roman reigns where he is not the guy that is on the road 250 days a year. Um, I I don't know if that, I don't know if that part was hit as hard, but at the beginning, like I do feel that is what he was trying to say is that, Without Paul Heyman, this is what you're looking at as champion. And, uh, hmm. you know, he can cite Lesnar and Roman as, you know, look at these deals I've got these guys. They barely have to show up. You can be at home with your family. And, and he has kind of been known to jump, you know, from hot act to hot act, right? At least his wrestling character, I mean. It's yeah. it's not going to be time for this anytime soon. But if there is a day to do the Cody turn, because of the history, uh, mm-hmm. being with Heyman would be a natural, I feel, with with those two. But... I don't think you're looking at that anytime soon. The other thing is, I, there's another mention of Dustin Rhodes tonight. So, you know, if you had to bet, would you expect Dustin at WrestleMania? If he's under a contract to AEW, I'm going to say no. Not not on screen. Like, at the, at the show, backstage, sure. He can go. And he's also, he's going to be all over that dusty A&E doc that they're airing the week before WrestleMania, which yeah. is probably going to be their... The Dustin one they promote the hardest because it ties into the biggest story they're they're telling with yeah. Cody trying to finish the story. <laughs> right. So we know we know like you know Tony has allowed AEW talents to appear on WWE things, um, like that 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 documentary, like Chris Jericho. On, Dude, they're on doing Jake session. this week on A and E. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know why I don't know why Tony allows his talent to do this other than he's when trying to be accommodating. But when, when it seems like it's things attached to like a man's legacy, like honestly, what, what is Jake doing in AEW right now? You know, Tony would seem like a bad guy if he prevented Jake from getting a documentary made about him. Now, where does he draw the line? You know, like is Dustin Rhodes appearing in the, the walkout or, or I don't know, in the in the front row of a, of a Cody Rhodes WWE match? Does he draw the line there or would he does he look at, you know, hey, like I'm I'm a, I'm such a good guy to my talent, I'm going to allow this as well. Where does Paul Levesque draw the line? 
Who, which WWE wrestler would he let walk oh, down? Yeah, none. I mean, yeah, none. I don't think any. But like, I understand they're not, they're not like the that, that this would mean a lot. But it's like, what is the value of contracts? And it's like I'm paying you. I'm paying you to go. And this is the guy let that let William Regal like out of his contract early, or at least didn't renew or, or whatever that meant. You know. Did get the restriction. It's not as though he can appear on camera this year, but yeah, ultimately he got he got out. And uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I'm just you know left wondering if I should look more any more into these frequent Dustin mentions. It, you would certainly. I mean, Cody has said as much. He wants. He w- he would hope that that he's he's there. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure it is is something that you know I could certainly see the idea of you know maybe a compromise is like he is seated in the front row and he'll be be showing or or something like that but mm. you know it's he would be well within his rights to say no like these guys are taking shots at me on their pay-per-views yeah. i'm i'm not doing a favor i'm sorry i like you guys but i'm not helping you guys in that company you want to go to a new japan show have at it you want to be in the front row at impact i'll pay for the seats it's mm. but we're not doing wrestlemania Asuka and Nikki Cross. So uh, this goes nine and a half minutes. And this was weird. The bell rang and then Bianca Belair came out. So they had to just pause in the ring as she does her whole entrance, which is very odd for the Nikki Cross character to have to just be stuck there waiting. Um, It just felt as though she should have just come out, then the bell rings. Uh, But instead, it was just a bit awkward. After seeing like these talents wait, I don't know, 10 minutes, like between their entrances and the start of their matches sometimes at these TV tapings, I mean, it it, it seems kind of normal at this point. So Cross stops the Asuka lock, turns it into a cradle shot. Crowd was not hot for this match. Asuka then counters a swinging neck breaker, applies the arm bar, and submits Nikki Cross. So uh, finally, Liv Morgan was not the one uh, submitting to Asuka's arm bar. Nikki Cross got the honors on Monday night, and we would get... Some character evolution with Nikki Cross later in the show. As yes, well. we would. Yes, someone sat down and watched my award-winning interview and said, "You know what? <laughs> There's some ideas here. You, maybe you are responsible for for this new new push." Yeah. Um, Bel Air. You know, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Y- no, nothing. I have nothing more to say to the yeah, match. Yeah. It was a simple match. Bel Air got into the ring, holds up the title. And they both point to the sign. They both know where they're going. And then Oscar spits up this blue liquid and. Bianca Belair had to convey, look horrified and keep that look for like a solid minute. So Mm -hmm. we get it from every angle. This felt too contrived for Bianca Belair to have to look uh, like at this. Like, would would you be that horrified if I like spit up blue? Maybe if I did right now. Yeah, Yeah, I would. Like if all of a sudden blue liquid just, you know, Mountain Dew, pitch blue, cold blue, just dripped dripped out of your, your mouth. Yeah, I'd be freaked out. Um. But, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, she just finished the feud with Alexa as this, like, um, fiend, pseudo-fiend character. Um, and now she's actually kind of doing something similar. But, you know, Asuka is a lot more, I think, just, like, supposed to be um, just um, crazy and, and just scary and not necessarily, like, um, supernatural. Um but uh, it's a cool look, and, and essentially, like this whole Asuka rebrand has been sold based off of her makeup. Like, I don't know if there's all that much different about her in ring. Um, she's got a new finisher, but it's because the makeup looks so cool that everybody is all of a sudden very excited for her. Um, that and plus she oozes blue liquid out of her, out of her mouth. But um, I'm I I kind of want to see a little bit more of difference, you know, like in Oscar, like what exactly? And they're trying, they're trying with this blue liquid. They're clearly they're making a point to not have her speak as this version of Oscar, and um, they're and that's why the things like the blue liquid. It's going to be a challenge to see like Bianca Belair try to like create the story, you know, especially if they don't have Oscar talk. Yeah, it's like I thought of ideas where maybe you do some kind of like video packages with with oscar and you know put like a jeremy borash behind that but it's like you 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 don't want to humanize they clearly don't want to humanize oscar so it's a it's kind of a tough match to build up it feels like it's going to be a great match but our those videos don't necessarily have to humanize somebody yes if you tell a human story but maybe they they tell a not, something that's not necessarily you know maybe, maybe not, it's maybe it's hardy compound jeremy borash that can tell the backstory of Asuka I will say I think now is the time for for them to like shoot a cool video like that with Asuka speaking in Japanese with subtitles like something that gives us 
some depth of, of, of who she actually is so that we could hear her in her natural voice. I don't know why, like on the main roster, they, they never do that. Like on in NXT, they go, they, they don't, they do it. Kathy Kelly interviewed Carmella and asks after losing at elimination chamber, how are you going to get to WrestleMania? She hasn't figured it out yet, uh, but she wants to take on Oscar. Then she catches up with Rollins and says that Logan Paul ruined his WrestleMania plans twice, but the joke is on Logan. He's going to find him and hurt him. But since he's not here tonight, he's going to take it out on The Miz. They recapped Lashley and Lesnar at Elimination Chamber, and MVP was backstage calling Brock Lesnar a coward because he could not escape the hurt lock. And he says that next week, Omos is going to issue a challenge to Brock Lesnar for WrestleMania and Brock can show up to give his answer. I hope that MVP comes out and cuts this scathing promo on Brock Lesnar. We get Omos screaming, I want you at WrestleMania, and Brock comes down. He walks to the ring. He smiles, takes the microphone, and says, no way, I'm not taking you on. Yeah, what is this now? Is this misdirect, or are they seriously considering this direction? I can't fathom this happening at WrestleMania. I think this has to be a misdirection. Why can't you fathom it? Oh, I Vince would have booked this match 100%. Well, what are you trying to say? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it's at least possible in, you know, in some attachment to the WWE. I so, could see this match happening on TV. Right. Because I think so, they've wanted to do this match, but it means nothing anymore, I think, or very little. But giving an F5 to this guy would be a cool spot on TV. It is not mm-hmm. the basis of a six-week build for WrestleMania. I guess what I'm left questioning coming out of this match is whether or not Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lashley are still attached at WrestleMania. I can't see how they're not after that finish on Saturday. But but his role tonight, I, I don't think you had any indication of, of any attachment between the two. I mean, do you see Lashley and Bray together? I just, this to me feels like this would be such a waste of Brock Lesnar with, with Omos. Like, I think this would be among the worst ideas. I, I don't know if Bobby Lashley and, and Brock Lesnar at this point is that much bigger either. But, I mean, it's interesting the way that they're framing this. I mean, with the WrestleMania logo for, for this challenge and everything, um, it would be quite the way, I think, to um, maybe discard. Four-way, Ol- four-way with Omos. Let's get <laughs> all of them into the match. You're t- saying Uncle Howdy, Omos, Five Brock Lesnar? Uncle Howdy. Five. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Uh, either way, I'm kind of curious to see what they'll do next week. You know, it's either a, a major misdirect and, and Omos will come out of it looking like a complete clown, or they might actually be considering Omos in a role with Brock Lesnar at Mania. Let's remember, they're flying Brock to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Are they, they, of, that might be a drive from Saskatchewan. It's, it's a long drive from Saskatchewan. Right. The mm-hmm. Miz versus Seth Rollins. It, They actually had a pretty nice match here. Crazy how everyone seems to always have their best matches on Raw with Seth Rollins. Uh, Graves says that next week The Miz will unveil whatever was in the envelope because The Miz is an unbiased journalist and WWE is chock full of them. Yes. Our our carryover line. Mm -hmm. Miz did his, uh, his Daniel Bryan offense, also introduced a code breaker off the turnbuckle, and then, I am not exaggerating, there was one guy literally one guy that was screaming tiny balls to try and get it over. And this one guy tried multiple times and it failed both times. You know, this is one voice yet you could hear. I mean, clearly he's been holding that for a long, long time. Like they don't come to Ottawa too often. No, I mean, edge hasn't been here in 18 years. So you got to make it count when you've got the, the cameras rolling. He nails Miz in the back of the neck and then one stomp, second stomp, and then a third stomp as the referee is so concerned, he calls for the bell and Rollins wins by referee stoppage. Yes, he does. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought this was, I was a bit tuned out of this match. And for me, it was about as much of a, just a match that I've seen Seth Rollins in um, that I can remember. Uh, it was a TV match. It was a uh, yeah, not uh, not anything to go out of your way to see, but it was it was fine. Pierce grants Carmella a match with Oscar for next week, and then he gets a call on his phone, and it is Chelsea Green, who has been mistakenly sent to Ottawa, Illinois, instead of Ottawa, Ontario. Which uh, Ottawa, Illinois, by the way, the home of uh, Maria Canellis. 
You're kidding. I didn't yeah. know it existed. That's wow. the only reason I've ever heard of Ottawa, Illinois. But mm. I thought this was actually kind of funny that they, they, uh, she has been sent to Ottawa, Illinois, and Pierce has got to get her sent to Grand Rapids for next week to be in the right city. Kind of interesting that like um, Chelsea Green wasn't on a Canadian show. I guess so. Yeah. Um, Maybe not that interesting. I okay. Don't know. Alpha Academy are talking about their modeling careers when Bronson Reed shows up and uh, he's going to put Chad Gable in a body cast. Ding dong hello with Bailey and damage control. So this is where it was noted. It's family day and uh, Kai refers to Bailey as their fearless leader and they have been champions for over 100 days. Becky interrupts them stating they never defend the titles. So she has a partner and out comes Lita in Ottawa and they chant for her name and they've put their past issues behind them and they issue a challenge they're not going to accept but then Becky lays down the ultimate the ultimate argument for a title match are you scared Bailey accepts on behalf of the tag champions and then these two grab the belts and hold them up and we've got our tag title match next week with Lita and Becky challenging damage control I thought the segment felt kind of awkward especially towards the end where like becky and lita throw the belts back at bailey and eo and somehow eo and bailey have to sell for this toss of these like championships that are now i guess a ton we, um, we would think given the history that becky would maybe uh, shy away from <laughs> segments involving people throwing the belts at one another that's it exactly yeah um i i, I and like anything involving damage control and like ding dong hello i think has to be like sort of comedic in tone um and becky could do comedy i i just didn't think this was a great example of of, of that do you think um, we're getting the belts lifted onto becky and lita like yeah. that's the tag direction for I do. for the show and that would in theory free up damage control if this rumored match with Shayna and Ronda is going down or they're doing something I, else. I feel like a more natural path would be Shayna and Ronda versus Becky and Lita in that case. I agree. That would be like the more damage control are still heels. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. And why would you suddenly put Becky and Lita in a tag team if not to face another tag team? Well, maybe, maybe they are going that. That's It's a much more attractive match if you have uh, Becky and uh, Lita together for Ronda and Shayna Baszler. I would contend that Becky versus Ronda is still a pretty attractive match. Well, if they're doing the tag match, it would certainly be a question as to why yeah. um, they're doing the tag match. But hey, um, hmm. they're, they are at this point, and it looks like Ronda and Shayna will be in a team at WrestleMania, and we will see where they're going. Saxton is with Candice LeRae. She's asking for an update on Johnny Gargano. He's banged up from the chamber, but then she runs off to see Nikki Cross. Why are you following me? And she says, I've got a match with Piper Niven next week. I can't focus on Piper Niven and you stalking me. So uh, what's going on? So Nikki whispers to Candice LeRae and uh, intrepid reporter Byron Saxton gets to the bottom of this. And Candice was told by Nikki, all her friends are gone and she is alone. Yeah. Some actual character development here for Nikki Cross and for Candice LeRae for that matter. You know, like two of several like women in these divisions that uh, have had nothing other than introductions and losses and just meaningless entries into Royal Rumbles and Elimination Chambers. You know, we're actually getting some storytelling here and I'm I'm excited for this. You know, Nikki playing sort of that like uh, lonely weirdo with no friends wanting to become friends with Candace and, and, and doing it in sort of like a very relatable way that I think especially young people could watch and relate to. I I think there's a lot of potential there. Chad Gable and Bronson Reed, pretty short match, not enough that Gable could have one of his uh, more enjoyable matches. This is more so a backdrop for the Maximum Male Models. Maxine shows up at ringside, distracts Otis, and this leads to Gable being distracted by the distraction as Reed. Um, we did see Gable get a bridging German onto Reed, which was impressive. And then Gable is calling on Otis, who is distracted, and there's a splash to Gable, followed by a power slam and tsunami as Reed wins in three minutes and 16 seconds. Mm-hmm. I was a little disappointed that like Reed wasn't more of a like focus of the match, and and that this was largely a segment like to serve the Otis Maximum Male Models thing. Just because I I felt like Reed gained so much um from Saturday that I would have liked to have seen him win without a distraction, um even though you know he did he it wasn't necessarily to help him, 
But, um, you know, Raw is a TV show, and on a TV show, you need your Otis Maxwell male model segment. So, yeah. yeah, I do hope Bronson gets something of note for Mania. Like, he's not tied to mm-hmm. anything, but hopefully this is not just, you know, he's in a battle royal. I don't, I don't know if he's got enough time to, to get hot enough for it. Speaking of not hot enough, uh, Elias is in the ring. He tells Rick Boogs to take notes in the back that he is the biggest star. He is the biggest legend and asks who wants to walk with Elias at WrestleMania. So Bobby Lashley comes out, beats the hell out of him, hurt lock and tells, says that Lesnar panicked in the hurt lock. No one breaks the hurt lock and he's not going to be disrespected by anyone in the locker room or he's going to put them down. So no, no sense here. But he said he did. He did name drop Lesnar and he name dropped Bray Wyatt in his promo. Yeah, he did. So uh, maybe it's one of those. I'll tell you, like, the other thing that, like, maybe has me questioning the Brock Lesnar rematch direction It's is that Bobby Lashley, after playing heel for, I don't know, this entire couple months, <laughs> came out slapping, like, high-fiving fans. Um, he, like, is, fa- you know, beats up an, a heel in Elias. I, I just, I don't know what's going on. It, it, like, this happened Wasn't last Elias time. a baby face? Look, when, when did he no. make this grand heel turn? But he is, well, I don't know if it was Grant, but he's certainly a heel against Rick Boogs. You know, he was, he was hanging out with the Street Profits. Yeah, but he was also cocky. Like, he's he's like technically a baby face, but he's not somebody you're supposed to like. Okay. And you had Bobby Lashley beat up somebody that we're not supposed to like. So um, I don't know what's going on with Bobby Lashley. Like, it seems like every time he faces Brock Lesnar, he suddenly turns into a baby face. And then literally like two days later becomes a or sorry but becomes a heel against Brock Lesnar but then two days later becomes a baby face again so I, I you know I I really am perplexed about maybe their direction for mania how about this story for Bobby Lashley so every year we get the the person who doesn't have a path to WrestleMania how are they going to get on the card so what if Adam Pierce rules that when you answered Elias's challenge that was your commitment to face Elias at WrestleMania so for the next six weeks <laughs> It's Bobby Lashley trying to get out of WrestleMania and his match with Elias. It was like, I'll put my shot up against anyone. And he can't help, but he still beats these guys. Like, he can't lose to these inferior people. And he sorry, can't get sorry. off. This is, this is some very complex stuff. Um, so Bobby Lashley is stuck contractually in, or, or by order. He wants to get out of this match with Elias at WrestleMania. He's stuck in, into a match with Elias. Yes. And to get out of it, he has to lose to somebody else, yet he's too proud pu- to lose. I'll put my WrestleMania spot up against you, Otis. Yet at the last minute, he decides not to lose. He or... just can't. He can't lose to to Otis. Like it's why can't like, he just lie down? It's his fighter's mentality that kicks in at the end, and he just he just ends up that he b- by fluke he keeps winning these matches, and he's stuck in this WrestleMania f- going nowhere match with Elias. So a story where a man actively tries to lose a match, okay, and that includes like okay, like he'll he'll try to like you know win via countout finish, and then all of a sudden like by some act of god he has he finds himself back in the ring he loses like that and he wins even though he wants to lose yes like it's like a man who's trying to like like it's it's gonna sound kind of dark but a man who's trying to like kill himself but can't and that leads to mvp telling lashley this is because winning is in your dna bobby you can't deny it okay well thank you this sounds way more compelling than omos and brock lesnar Hmm. Yeah, you could be right. Next week in Grand Rapids, we have the women's tag title match. Candice LeRae against Piper Niven. Brock Lesnar will answer the challenge of Omos. Asuka takes on Carmella and a WrestleMania edition of Miz TV. Okay. So either a WrestleMania baby or uh, Miz has uh, something else. Saxton interviews Edge. This is a very good interview. He says that Judgment Day is now in the rear view and Beth Phoenix is back at home with the kids. Just that opening line, I think it told the tale of how you knew this was ending. It's like, Judgment Day is in the rear view and Beth is far far away from this arena tonight, so I'm all on my own. He says that Theory has the physical capabilities, but does he have the mental capabilities? With age comes wisdom, and he is going to slap Theory's duck face off his overly manscaped head giving every podcaster an easy uh, pivot to their ad read. And he hasn't had a title in a long time. That window is closing. And his second match 
ever with this company was in this arena in 1997. And he has not wrestled here in 18 years. And never say never to win this title tonight. Can he do it? Can he win the United States Championship? In eight, first time in 18 years. Wow. It's a long yeah. time. That's what I said to myself. And then I did the math. I'm like, that's only 2005. That doesn't feel like 18 years ago. Jesus. Wow. Uh, hmm. uh, Edge and Austin Theory is our main event of the evening. Edge uh, dumps Theory from the top and hits this high cross to the back of Theory. This was a different variation. The guy doesn't see you coming. That's a awkward bump to take. Audience is cheering for Edge, and then Edge's neck gets snapped on the top rope, but then Theory does his forward roll into a sit-out powerbomb. Theory leapfrogs the spear, and then a monkey flip with Edge landing on his feet into the crossface. Theory gets his foot on the rope, and then Theory is caught using the rope for leverage, and A-Town Down gets countered with an Impaler DDT, and as Edge is setting up for the spear, Finn Balor runs up, and he gets uh, knocked off the apron, roll up by Theory, and there's a kick out, and then Balor nails Edge with a kick into A-Town Down, and Theory pins Edge in 18 minutes and 17 seconds. Balor continues the attack, hitting three coup de grasses to Edge, and seems to confirm that judgment day not in the rear view mirror that that story has not had its final chapter yet the story never ends but we're entering <laughs> the epilogue yes yes i thought it was a good tv match you know accent accentuated perhaps uh for me ma mainly by this very strong audience and i think a really great promo from edge before you know talking about it was um, he like put emphasis on like the idea he could win this match and he always and adds importance to it, it, his it, match the emphasis that he doesn't have much time left in his career and his goal was to win some championships and he hasn't necessarily done that yet so because i thought edge did such a great job of conveying his intent to win with not much time left in this career in his career uh and because i i think you know, for me, at least, this match felt like it was about to fulfill the big Canadian pop that we didn't have over the past, you know, uh, weekend. Like, part of me thought that there was going to be a title change here because, like, Cena versus Theory doesn't necessarily need a championship. And Edge versus Balor would have been heightened if it was for a title. So I actually thought there, it was possible that, like, Edge could have won. Um but we didn't get that. And because of all those expectations, I think the Balor attack made was made to feel more despicable. And therefore, I think it significantly he heated the feud back up to a level that was more than I expected. Yeah. No, I, I think you you keep running this with, with theory. But it was it was a good television match. And overall, I thought for, for this episode of Raw, it was... Um, I thought the the Zane and Owen story, I like where that's going and kind of playing this out until they, they come together. And you probably shouldn't be putting them together six weeks out from from the show. So riding that out. Uh, the rest of this show, I would say mixed bag uh, at, at times. Uh, some Not the hottest crowd at times, but there was... A uh, lot of the matches were like just kind of like putting people into focus ahead of like, you know, a WrestleMania match. Yeah, like Dolphin Mustafa Ali. Like well, that was meaningless. That's a big, that, big money that a, match that we've got at the end of uh, the road. Yeah, that's that's a type of match that would likely get cut off of the Hulu. Um, <laughs> and then beyond that, we had Becky and Lita teaming up next week in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. All right, so you get Tanahashi and Okada and Becky and Lita teaming up uh, within uh, a week mm -hmm. of each other. All right. Let's, uh, we will be taking any super chats if you want to uh, send them our way and forum.postwrestling.com for all of your show feedback. We got a couple super chats here and it comes to us. One from Matt Hahn who sends $5. Thank you, Matt. He says, do you think a more satisfying end on Saturday would have been Sammy and George St. Pierre singing Oasis in the ring? Yeah, that would have been great for the live crowd. Then I would have been really mad if we had been taken to the uh, press conference and missed that. Uh, yeah. Playing off of, uh, yes, Tyson. Although Fury. it would likely have been Celine Dion instead of uh, Oasis. Oh, would Sammy's heart go on? Yeah, that would have been quite the scene. Uh, thank you, Matt, for, for the support. We go to Lee Hildebrand, who sends $5 as well. Thank you, Matt. Or th thank you, Lee, who says, thanks for the on-the-road shows. Always fun. Sorry about the view at the arena. John, hope the flooding problem turned out okay. 
Oh, I guess I haven't talked. Uh, the The flood situation did uh, was rectified within 24 hours. So it was yeah. um, on a scale of one to ten, it was maybe like a four or a five, and we we thankfully caught it in a, in enough time, so that we we weren't uh, too uh, out of sorts. How awful! From you know, you escape one flooding situation, and in Montreal, you enter another one with our terrible shower. Which did not. Has, has, has Way sent in any feedback yet? Have you have you posted a review? Uh, I've not had time, but uh, thinking about it, man, it's going to be a scathing one if <laughs> Way if Way opts to. Uh, why don't you kick off our feedback? I'm I I don't think I will. I uh, I don't feel like it. Oh, okay. and I don't have the thread up, so that's why. Okay, well let's uh, go to Benjamin here. Uh, good show, and it has me looking forward to more on SmackDown. It's Saint Viateur bag- Bagels. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Sammy and Kevin Owens, everyone in the bloodline, a story delivers the most compelling content. Uh, Everyone in that bloodline story delivers the most compelling content. Okay, Cody and Paul with yet another great segment. I wouldn't call that a great segment. I would call their last segment great. This one was, eh, it was was fine, but uh, to me it was nothing special that I'm going to remember. Uh, good women's segments. Oscar look great, though they're a little stuck on how to get Bianca into it. Becky and Lita versus Kai and Sky should uh, be very good. Theory and Edge had a great match. I'm not sure why Balor versus Edge is still going. Theory has been doing well and has been interesting as he grows in his character. There's a great, great brunch place called La Presse Composé and Pub Saint Pierre. La Presse Composé. La Presse Composé. La Passe right. Composé. Okay. Well, we, uh, way you copy these down for the next time we go to Montreal. Okay. Thank you. We got a Brandon Sears from Ottawa who says it was his first time attending Raw since May 2003 in Halifax. Wow. I've been his first Raw in 20 years. That's cool. I've been to a few Ottawa shows in years past, and this feels like the biggest crowd I've seen. Not sure how it came across on TV, but it was louder than I've heard most from most auto auto crowds. They, they were lively for like the big stars. Like it, it was like a similar Raw audience where it was. Mm-hmm. I don't recall any of the matches being too hot, but I mean they they went nuts for Zayn at the beginning, for Edge coming out, uh, for Cody coming out. Like they were into the big stars, and that was noticeable. Not as hot as Montreal uh, on either night, but. I would st- still classify it as a hot crowd. Yeah. Uh, Sammy and Owens both got the loudest reactions with Cody Edge and Lita not far behind. That said, the announcement of Omos and Brock meeting at WrestleMania received a lot of groans around me. I guess I shouldn't have gotten my hopes up for a potential match with Gunther. Really enjoyed Edge and Theory. Crowd bit on nearly every near fall. Edge received a standing ovation after the show. Gave a speech thanking the crowd. He said, if this is it for Edge in Ottawa, then damn it, thank you. I know you both were wondering, but it was Dolph Ziggler who had to stand around in the dark during the DX camera segment. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> One guy gets DX camera duty. Yeah. Hey, man, like Edge is like saying this pretty much at like every Canadian city, you know? Like this might be it for me. Um, if he comes back, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I feel like he <laughs> almost has to retire now. Like he's just kind of like, you know. Put himself in a tough spot. Well, maybe he's taking notes from uh, Keiji Muto, and he's going to slowly. He'll, Adam well, Copeland Edge. and Edge yeah. are going to. He get didn't a, wear a Sexton Hardcastle shirt at the press conference. So the, the whole run for him. Uh, Mark writes in. I attended live after some tickets unexpectedly were offered to me earlier today. On one hand, this is the biggest crowd I've seen in Ottawa since the Attitude Era shows. I've seen Wrestle Tick say eight thousand inch, which seems correct. Generally, even TV pre pandemic would max out at forty five hundred or so. On the other hand, being Ottawa, for the most part, it's a crowd that played nice and didn't go against what was being given to them. Even when those things included bizarre direction for certain talents like Lashley or Omos, or being given a 20-minute match between Sammy and Corbin. Edge versus Theory built to an enjoyable final few minutes, however, the ending left the crowd sort of dead and people walking out flat. Thankfully, Edge did some mic work post-match, but plenty fans left by then. Sitting through a three-hour Raw is something my 13-year-old self would have dreamed of, but my 39-year-old self is not interested in probably doing again. I will give them credit for attempting to keep audience participation going during prolonged TV breaks with the DX cam or the people's eyebrow cam. Although seeing a bunch of children excitedly crotch chopping for cameras as their parents cheer them on does make me question a lot of things going on. Hope the show was enjoyable, uh, an enjoyable watch at home. Were you crotch chopping at home during commercials? No way, I wasn't. Uh, we, we don't get the, uh, imagine they had that as the, the picture in picture that you could follow mm. along with. I will tell you, like, Samantha Irvin does, like, a sing-along. Like, she's singing the lyrics for the DX theme as they're doing this. Like, she is a great MC inside of the arena. She looks like she's having a lot of fun. 
Yeah. She certainly does, but like she's a great ring announcer. But you see, like her presence at the, like the a, in terms of like the live host inside the arena as well. Mm. All right. Finally, we go to Saeed from Vancouver, who says it looks like I was off of my on my thoughts from last night, thinking that it was going to be a triple threat angle at Mania for the title. Going to be fun seeing where this goes and how it builds. Asuka continues to look like her old self. People thought I was crazy when I speculated Demon Finn versus Edge at Mania, but it's looking more likely. What do you think, John? You think I don't know who thought demon. he was uh, crazy about that. I, I think like that. Yeah, that's that's a natural path to, to go to with these two. How do you do a heel demon fin? I guess, I mean, I'm sure you can, but it's such a baby face gimmick uh, up until this point. You could you could certainly tweak that to have it to have, uh, you know, hmm. suit the, the Judgment Day vibe uh, to it. Like you could do that. That would heighten it. Absolutely. Seeing a demon entrance at WrestleMania. I guess yeah, Demon I- Edge. Oh, uh, okay. Like the game, like the brood edge. Hmm. Has edge had like a, a, a significant demon form. Always the first time to use body paint. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, it's about one in the morning. Uh, I've been up a long time today, so we're going to sign off. Coming up this week, Tuesday night, postwrestlingcafe.com, we will have a review of the Muto retirement show. This is it. This is KG Muto retiring. Not not great Muda. This is this is the end. Last yes. love. Uh, so that is Tuesday. <laughs> Wednesday we'll be back with Rewind to Dynamite, and then uh, of course we have a uh, MCU later. Rewind to SmackDown, the NWA podcast. Tons of shows this week. Postwrestling.com, and if you want to jump on the video train, it's video.postwrestling.com where you can see Way and I react to Mudo's retirement. Yeah, every time John says the name of that show, he's going to do air quotes. And if you don't watch on video, you're going to miss it. Yep, yep. I love air quotes. They're very uh, underutilized. I think they were mocked for too long. They're going to make a comeback. But that is it. We are 